calling the meeting to order. Can we get the roll call, please? Tony Allegretti. Present. Ricardo Diaz. I'm here. Scott Dossett. Here. Katrina Kindle. Mikhail Lebensky. Present. Megan McGinty. Daryl Price. Present. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and, and introduce, and, and I spoke to Katrina earlier, so I, I know she's on her way and hopefully is not having technical trouble. Um, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and introduce our new members. And I, I asked them to just say a few words about um, their, why they wanted to be on the board as just a way for us all to get to know them a little bit. Tony? Yes, thanks, Mikhail. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you for appointing me to the board. Um, my name is Tony Allegretti. Um, I, I live in Urbana, obviously. Um, I'm a lawyer here in town. I work with the university with student legal services. Um, lived in Urbana uh, for about seven years now um, with my wife and kids, um, originally from Chicago suburbs. Um, and one of the serve on the board just has been looking to give back to the community, serve in some way. And uh, I felt like um, with my um, prior education, legal experience, um, and having I previously worked as a public defender, um, I thought this was a good fit uh, when I heard that there was a spot open. Um, so I'm hoping I can contribute um, to the board um, in a meaningful way. Great. Welcome. And, um, I have a text from Katrina who, who says that she cannot get her video to work, but she sees us. Um, my guess is that one of the people um, who is attending but is not a panelist is her. Um, yeah, Katrina, it looks like you might be uh, registered in with a different name. If you can raise your hand down at the bottom, you should be able to raise your hand and then I can let you in. There you go. I will uh, go ahead and promote you to panelist. And you should be joining us now. All right. All right. Welcome, Katrina. If it's possible for you to turn your camera on, uh, we would be happy to see you. If it's not, then it's not. Have you up there? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we can, can hear you, Katrina. Okay, I'm trying to fix it. It has my son's. Hold on just a second. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm not Kendall you Aaron. Do you now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> not Kendall. That's my son. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Katrina, welcome. Welcome to the board. I was just asking new members uh, to say a few words about why they wanted to be on the board. Um. Hi, my name is Katrina. I've lived in this town 40 plus years and I'm always looking to give back, um, to lend my voice where I can. And so when I found out that um, there was a vacancy on the board, um, I applied so that I can um, give my voice and to give back to the city of Urbana. All right, well, thank you and welcome. We're, we're happy to Happy to have you and happy to have a full board again. Um, all right, moving on to the third item. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is Second. I, I guess I should have said if there are any, uh, if there's anything that somebody wants to add to the agenda, this would be the time before we approve it. All right, is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I think we need a roll call. Tony Allegretti. Present. Ricardo Diaz. Speaking, yes. Scott Dossett. Yes. Katrina Kendall. Yes. Mikhail Abensky. Yes. Megan McGinty? 
Yes. Daryl Price? Yes. Okay. Uh, the agenda has been approved. Uh, we have um, uh, five sets of minutes from previous meetings that apparently have not been approved. So we're still in that process of uh, catching up to to all of the um, all of the things that we haven't been able to uh, or have not done in the past. So uh, so we need to approve these minutes. Uh, I don't know if we can do them as a batch or if we need to do them one at a time. Um, can somebody advise me on this? Uh, I think you can do them together. Okay. I'll, move that, I'll move that the minutes as listed in point four of today's agenda uh, be approved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, Jim. Um, your first vote has to be a motion with a second to group these as a unit and that must pass by unanimous approval and then after that you vote to approve the minutes as a group. I move vote. to group all of the uh, minutes under unit or part four of the agenda as one unit. I will second that motion. Okay can we get a roll call please? Tony Allegretti. Present. Ricardo Diaz. Approved, yes. Scott Dossett. Yes. Katrina Kendall. Yes. Mikhail Lubensky. Yes. Megan McGinty. Yes. Daryl Price. Yes. Okay, motion to uh, consolidate. I think Tony has to say yes instead of present. I'm sorry. Yes, I yes. Thank you. Uh, all right. Motion passes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'd like to motion to approve the minutes uh, listed under uh, four of the agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Can we get the roll call? Tony Allegretti. Yes. Ricardo Diaz. Yes. Scott Dossett. Yes. Katrina Kendall. Yes. Mikhail Lubensky. Yes. Megan McGinty. Yes. Daryl Price. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. We now move into the public participation portion of the meeting. Um, and as per our recent tradition, uh, we, we now have two opportunities, uh, one near the beginning and one near the end uh, for public participation. And, uh, and based on the number of people here, we, we can have a five minute limit. So let's go ahead and move to that. Um, if you want to talk, go ahead and raise your hand on the, uh, and I see four hands up. Um, let's start with Christopher Hansen and then we'll go to Emily Close. Hi, can you hear me all right? Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Christopher Hansen. I've uh, been a Urbana resident for a, a couple decades now. Um, I think some of you know my name and my voice. I've been attending your meetings for uh, the past year or so, um, trying to push for uh, changes. Um, I'm, I'm mostly going to express my continued disappointment for the board. Um, and it, it really isn't so much about you know, failure to take speed and make changes to the CPRB process, but the ongoing failure to recognize what is fairly obvious, you know, corruption and problems with city staff. Uh, our mayor, Diane Marlin, uh, city attorney, James Simon, city administrator, Carol Mitten, human relations, Vasilia Clark, Elizabeth K. Meharry, the list goes on and all these city staff members, these people are all verified liars. On multiple occasions, these people have knowingly made false statements to the public and to the city council members and to the board members and to the public. It's, it's painfully clear that these people are working contrary to the interests of the public and entirely on their own personal interest and the interest of their friends. Um, and no matter how well this fact is demonstrated, no, uh, no matter how many repetitions we have to go through, to, no one in an official capacity, such as the members of the CPRB, 
is willing to recognize it. And just something so simple as Carol Mitten repeatedly denying police complaints and repeatedly violating the CPRB ordinance. And I mean over and over and over, and Vasilia Clark as well, and I've brought this to your attention over and over and over. None of you have ever recognized that this is happening. Uh, it, it's, it blows my mind uh, that, that a board, a civilian board, with the primary task of bringing skepticism at city employees cannot recognize when there is city employee misconduct. It's, it's as though it's, it's an impossible, it's, it's not on your, your control board. It's just not there. Um, and I just don't understand why that is. And you know, I, I've even demonstrated violations of FOIA law to this board in regards to documents related to the Urbana Police Department. And there's been virtually no recognition of any of this. Um, so what I think is happening here is that boards like this find it substantially more comfortable and more convenient to befriend the police department and the city staff that they deal with and the, the representation from the police department that you know works with them. It is far more convenient and comfortable for you to just uh, accept that dishonesty and that corruption um, because you only come across a complainant once and you might never see their face and you never speak to them. So it's just so easy uh, to just allow corruption to go through. Um, so that's what needs to change for there to be anything meaningful going forward. And I, I don't, I don't really have much hope for that. I don't see that it's happening here or in, in any other board that I've approached. But anyways, onto, onto newer business. And I actually, maybe this is just more of the same. I'm really questioning the sensibility of using Michael Schlosser as a source of information for this board. Um, I, I felt compelled to be polite at the last meeting. Um, since my understanding is that he's essentially a guest. Uh, if I'm wrong about that and he's being paid, please someone correct me. But, but as I see, uh, Schlosser is, you know, really just kind of a public relations clown for the police department. And he, his job is to say a lot of things that sound good in theory, but don't actually represent what is happening in our police departments uh, to the extent that he's either lying or completely misinformed about how our local police departments actually operate. And, you know, he kind of, I've watched him present at, at other venues other than just the last CPRB meeting. And his tactic is really to present what sounds like a good story, but also to substantially litter the story with his charming, what he calls dad jokes, and essentially try to charm the audience more so than actually have a, you know, an honest conversation with them. And I, it doesn't really give me any hope and I just don't see the point of it. I want to know, what, what source of information is the CPRB going to pursue that isn't really just asking the police department um, for their opinion? Is it possible that the CPRB might have their own opinion about training or standards, or, or is it possible you might invite someone who isn't associated with the police to present their point of view? Um, I mean, the public have been trying to do that repeatedly, but they don't really get an opportunity to make a presentation or something. So. Uh, well, I'll, I'll cut it off there. Actually, you know what, I, I'm gonna mention one more thing. I see you're gonna be discussing the first-hand account language in the CPRB ordinance later. And I'll, I'll just cite this as another example of uh, James Simon and Carol Mitten trying to snub the complaint process and Vasilia Clark, and that's their tactic. They use these little tools to, to deny complaints and they've done it in many different ways. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. You have a talent for time management. Um, and I appreciate the, the comments about um, the problems that you're continuing to see in terms of FOIA and denial of complaints. Uh, I'm not going to respond to all of, all of the things that you listed, but uh, I, I do want to say that, uh, that while we have not gone into the character of any of the city staff here, um, we are certainly pursuing all of the specific uh, um, you know, logistics and procedure items uh, that you've mentioned. Uh, so, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, Emily Close. Emily? Good 
Good evening. My name is Emily Close. I live in Champaign. I've been involved with the um, citizen complaint process for about a year now with Urbana, about two years in Champaign. And as I look at the agenda for tonight, I was pretty concerned and surprised at the gall of approving five sets of minutes. Um, four sets were from last fall and last winter. I think that's a rather flagrant violation of the Open Meetings Act. I see that Mr. Simon's on the call, who is your city attorney, so I'd really like him to address this matter now. You don't get 11 months, for example, to complete, present, and approve minutes from September 25th, 2019. That's absurd, also embarrassing for the city of Urbana to continue to be so derelict in its staff and council oversight of the CPRB. I'm sure the mayor and city administrator will try to snow citizens into believing that these unprecedented historical times give the city special magical powers to ignore the Open Meetings Act. Yes, this might be the year of COVID, Mayor Marlin, and yes, the virus does have a mind of its own. But as a public body, the CPRB still must follow the Open Meetings Act, or the city of Urbana must answer to its citizens and tell us why you broke Illinois state statute. We, the citizens, have to follow the ordinances of Champaign and Urbana. What exempts the city staff of Urbana from not following Illinois state statute? Please explain this to me. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Jane McClintock, uh, followed by Tracy Chung. Hi, and welcome to the board, um, Katrina and Tony. Uh, my name is Jane McClintock, and I'm a resident of Urbana. Um, I've been writing um, and discussing with the CPRB several um, issues, and I hope that the new members and the old members have all had a chance to review the um, citizen um, list of recommendations and have been able to, to think through um, how they want to respond to them and implement them um, on the board. But one of my major concerns, um, and I appreciate that you're um, taking it on today, is this language of firsthand knowledge. I was just flabbergasted when you presented this new form, taking off the unwarranted and unnecessary requirement for a notary, but then um, changing the language to say that the complainant must be physically present, despite there being no um, language to that effect in the ordinance. Um, and I just wanted to speak briefly to the legal definition of firsthand knowledge. Um, firsthand knowledge refers to something that the witness has seen or heard as distinguished from something that they've heard from some other person. So it essentially is about firsthand knowledge, not hearsay. So um, I'm sure, Mr. Allegretti, you have, you know, some opinions yourself, but I have checked in with my attorney just to um, understand that, you know, my, uh, you know, legaldefinitions.com um, understanding is reasonable. And she um, did corroborate that as I have written to the board about. And I just want to say, like, uh, you know, in, in a legal context, a video, like, you know, it, when I spoke to the chief of police about this, he said, well, we wouldn't have a video, a person who viewed a video be a witness in a court case. Um, and it's like, well, no, you wouldn't. You just have the video. Like you just say, is this video accurate? And as long as the video is accurate, it would be, you know, perfectly um, reasonable evidence to, to have in a court case. Um, similarly, if there was video of somebody breaking a window or stealing a car, I'm sure that the police would be um, open to using that as evidence to pursue an investigation against that person. So not only is the legal um, interpretation very shaky, but I think that Mr. Simon's um, contention that the reason we should stick with it is because the precedent has already been set that we have this bad interpretation, I think is just really um, unreasonable considering that the precedent set by this board is of, you know, really kind of woeful neglect as the two previous folks have kind of alluded to. Um, and so I really hope that you'll take a new path forward. And I also would want to have you consider the impact that cell phone videos, you know, that the prevalence of video recording has had on just 
our whole country being able to understand the situation of policing. Um, and so the context of this decision in terms of making this a meaningful board is really significant. And the only, you know, the only concerns that I've really heard have been those sort of like small logistical concerns, which I have total confidence that y'all can overcome. So I won't take up any more of your time with this, but I really hope that um, the new members and the members that have been on here, um, I know that you all, you know, in your hearts really are doing this for the right reasons. And so I hope that you'll be able to come at it with a, a visionary perspective and enable the board to be um, a meaningful body that you know can really help Urbana to um, be a safe and just place for, for everybody who lives here. So thank you for your time and um, thank you for ser your service on the board. Thank you. That's Karen. all I got. Yep, thank you. Um, uh, I'll uh, I'll respond to to your comments when we begin the discussion, um, and not take up any time here. Um, so the last person I see with a hand is Tracy Chung. Tracy, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I'm Tracy Chung, resident of Urbana. Um, today, I would just like to say that the problems with um, the city and Urbana Police Department trying to withhold documents mm -hmm. have not been fixed or even improved. Um, I still cannot get my FOIA request. Um, sorry, I hear some interference. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you're, you're, you're clear and loud. Okay. I still cannot get my FOIA request for Urbana Police Do Department documents filled. I tried applying for a fee waiver as soon as I knew it was an option mentioned by Urbana City Attorney James Simon during the special FOIA presentation. My request for a fee waiver today was denied today by Assistant City Attorney and FOIA Officer Kurt Borman. His excuse was that my case was apparently closed due to time limits imposed by um, city staff. I was notified of this rejection more than one month after applying for the waiver and only after having spoken about it week after week at city council. Um, apparently, Urbana has a double standard when it comes to timelines. Um, Kurt Borman's excuse of my case being closed is ridiculous, especially considering how Urbana itself has no regard for timelines when it comes to the public. Is my FOIA request case sealed in an iron box and dumped into the ocean? Uh, Refusing to open it and give it further consideration is just another way of creating more roadblocks and hurdles. Another great example is um, Urbana Police Department policies. At one meeting, Urbana Police Chief Brian Serafin said that CPRB members and City Council uh, should be able to have access to the unredacted UPD policies. However, of course this didn't happen. When questioned again at the July 20th City Council meeting, Brian Serafin avoided the question and shamelessly passed the buck to James Simon. James Simon seemed to be totally out of the loop, blurting out something stupid about FOIA requests. When corrected, Simon admitted that he had not reviewed the Urbana Police Department policies, so he could not comment. How shameless is this avoidance of responsibility by Chief Serafin and James Simon? It has been months since the issue of UPD policies has been brought up. Um, but I'm guessing, and I hope I'm wrong, but um, that none of you have seen the unredacted policies. Um, have any of you followed up with the issues? What excuses did they give this time? Um, this is really tiring, but nothing has changed. The city is still being so obscure when it comes to releasing police documents. I think this should be one of the main concerns of this board. How can policing be reformed and how can police be held accountable if the simple act of transparency is not addressed? Lastly, I'm looking forward to the discussion of the first-hand um, account. Um, and I hope um, you guys take account, into account the unbiased legal definitions as described by um, Jane McClintock and not base your decision on precedents that have been sculpted in the past years by the police department in collaboration with city staff. And these people have every interest in protecting themselves. Just because it was that way in the past by people um, with conflicts of interest, um, I think it's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. Um. 
Hold on, give me a second to get the agenda on my screen. Okay. Uh, moving on to unfinished business. Um, Ricardo, can you can you give us um, an update on on the state of the current open appeals? Yeah, let me uh, pull them up. It's uh, I'm looking at the spreadsheet of uh, what is in our file. I recommend all members uh, go into that uh, folder. Uh, Katrina and Tony, you guys have access, and, or you should have access by the end of this meeting to see um, where they're at. Uh, but basically, uh, of the, let me just pull the total, I just messed it up on my screen. Um, this year has been an unusual uh, year in that we have a lot more complaints uh, filed, uh, but, uh, we have logged 32 complaints uh, that have been uh, put forward. They have been dealt, and I and I can go into uh, uh, some detail. But uh, one we dealt with uh, very directly. Uh, I don't remember. I think we we reported at the last meeting because it dealt with something that where there's litigation open and so by ordinance we don't cover. Um, another one, uh, well, bottom line is that there are 20 open complaints uh, uh, or 20 open appeals that would come to us uh, at a particular uh, time later. They all have to do with one complainant uh, or they were all put forward and so those appeals, we are trying to get uh, a time in which we can deal with uh, with them. Uh, we we will just keep on trying until we get a, a mutually uh, acceptable time. Uh, so, warning you uh, right now. I think they're waiting on one piece of information, and then they they you know the doodle will come back to us. Uh, we are trying very hard to put as many of them together uh, because it is one person. Uh, but so that you know, there has to be a, a, a time in which we all agree. And then there's a, I forget the official term, but a mediator, uh, not a mediator, but a, a, a hearing. Is that, is that the right word? A hearings officer. A hearings officer available for the time slot. So anyway, so it's a lot of moving pieces, but it's it's a matter of calendaring it. Uh, so uh, that's the one that, that that we're pending on as it, when it comes to actual uh, appeals. Um, so that's a report. I can go in through questions or anything else. I have this the, the spreadsheet in front of me that you know. If you want. Or refer to something specific. Okay. Uh, do any of the board members have have questions about either the number of complaints or the number of appeals and just sort of the status of, of where we are? Hey, just a quick question. So the spreadsheet is a list of the open pending appeals? That Correct. Um, and so the spreadsheet reflects what's in uh, what's what what should reflect what uh, of complaints have been filed and have advanced to appeal. And it's in the folder that you should have accessibility to. Okay. Thanks. Um, and just I, excuse me, I find it helpful uh, as, I mean, it, it, you get a different view when you see the whole thing summarized. So I, I find it helpful to look at the complaints individually um, as they come, or at least every once in a while, uh, so that you get a sense of things that are coming on. Because otherwise, it gets confusing dates and stuff like that. I think uh, uh, the 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 word uh, uh, from public comment. There are timelines that that are here and, and being followed, uh, and we need to 
we need to keep track of them. In fact, eventually I'll have a spreadsheet that double checks, uh, you know, filing dates, response dates and all that. Uh, but right now the complaint one is pretty full uh, as to what there is there. I just wanted to jump in uh, and when the new members were introducing themselves, I meant to uh, to confirm uh, now during the open meeting, as I confirmed earlier today with both of them, uh, that they did watch the orientation training video and uh, and therefore are um, can be considered fully seated members of the board uh, during this meeting. So is that a yes? Is that a question? Are you no, no? I well, I mean, we can do it. Um, yeah, let's let's. Uh, Katrina, have you had a chance to review the video? Yes. Yes, thank you. And Tony, have you had a chance to review the orientation video? Yes, I did watch the video. Okay, thank you. Um, I, have, I have a question. I have a question, Ricardo. Yeah. Um, of the, I think you said 32 complaints. Uh, of the 12 that are non, um, the one individual, um, do we anticipate any uh, appeals? in any of those or do you actually so, so i misspoke so we have yeah 32 logged in um um let me see just a quick summary three of those appeals uh um uh, well and another one so four of those are actually waiting for the pending the litigation so uh so that's four out of of, of those and then uh, eight of those appeals are also just waiting for their information. Uh, and I have to say here, I- uh, excuse, excuse me, eight yeah. appeals or eight complaints? Eight appeals. Okay. Yeah. And so they're waiting for further information. Uh, I, I, I have learned a lot, a lot about FOIA recently and I think that it is at, at some point uh, good to clarify, we, are, we, we aren't in charge of FOIA. We don't have anything to do with the FOIA process and it's not even a law that, you know, it's city, it is, I, I believe federal, uh, but there are timelines and there are respects and there are reasons and all that, that 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 law applies to. As I've been reading more and understanding, I had fired, filed before, but, uh, there are reasons to to uh, mark up and um, you know not show certain information. There are reasons for rejecting. There are reasons for charging. All those, uh, you know, I do. Uh, you know, we we have had a training on it. Uh, at least I don't not too long ago. But as I've read more, I've come to understand. While we don't have anything to to do with it. We are affected by it because if somebody's clogged because they don't have a FOIA, as was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, that needs to be resolved. Uh, and there are times at which we may uh, we 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 are affected and would be interested in an outcome so that the information is out enough that that the person can act on them. I I don't know what their legal options are, but I know that they don't have to do with us uh, because we are not FOIA officers and we are not interpreters of FOIA, but we are affected by people having the information to act on their uh, case. So I, I want to put that on everybody's minds because if at, you know, if there are particular issues of it, I don't know. I know we don't have the, the, the sway to do, but we should be asking questions. Uh, because I have had to ask questions on FOIAs before uh, as to timing and whatever else. And from legal, not, not just at the city, but actually at, at state level, um, they usually draw a very clean line that if, you know, I'm not an interested party or I, do I have a right to that information or even to say something about it. But I think it is helpful for us to be highly aware that we are affected because we do have cases in front of us. So, you know, 
right. So that, that's, that's the report as to the numbers uh, in front of us. Uh, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get a handle of is uh, uh, in terms of the 12 non-bundled complaints. Yeah. Do we have any appeals in that population of complaints? Well, no, in this case, we're, we're only talking appeals. And so, I, as I mentioned, okay. All right. uh, three of those have been, uh, uh, they're, they're pending litigation, so we, we can't touch them. Well, actually four, if you count the, 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 the other one that got rejected, because there is already a, a litigation. Uh, and then the eight, uh, which, which would make uh, the 12, uh, are, are pending further information. Again, I think that we have changed the rules for, for fi filing a little bit. We can come back to that in a little bit. But uh, these were all filed early enough uh, that the, the, the old rules applied. So further information needs to be put forward. So I, I, you know, we may need to make this its own agenda item, but since we start to talk about FOIA a little bit, and since that was something that was brought up by two different people during public comment, uh, it's not, if there's some kind of systemic uh, reason why folks who are submitting a complaint are not able to get the materials that they need through FOIA. Uh, now, if they, if they are not allowed to access, if they're not allowed access to certain things that they want because of FOIA regulations, that's fine. I'm not talking about that. But if, if it's something that they should have access to, but the timeline is such that they're not receiving access to those materials until, until after the deadline to, um, you know, to submit an appeal, then we clearly have a systemic problem here. And Jim, you popped them up on the screen. I'm guessing you want to say something? Sure. I hadn't planned on talking about FOIA, but I will. You all on the CPRB are impacted by FOIA because you obtain records and create records. Those records are subject to FOIA requests. In providing the records, people within the city are trained and extremely experienced in especially police FOIA requests in determining whether certain information should be withheld, either by withholding entire documents or through redactions of specific information. And in fact, there are more than 70 different exemptions provided in FOIA. Some are appear in Section 7 of FOIA, and others appear in Section 7.5. Uh, I don't believe that, any of you... To, hold on, but that, this, this, these aren't the... That's not the assertion that the folks are making. I understand. They're complaining I'm about there. redaction. They're complaining about timeline. Well... Uh, the way I heard it is they're complaining that they aren't getting the information they believe they are entitled to. Very simply, you all are not the arbiters of what information should be given or what information should not be given. The city is the arbiter as to what should be given and what should be withheld. If a FOIA requester, whether any of the individuals who spoke this evening or any other requester, doesn't agree with the city determination, the proper process is not to go to you all because you don't have authority to direct the city on production of information in a timely manner or not a timely manner. The remedy for the FOIA requesters is one of two options. They can seek review by the Public Access Bureau in the Attorney General's office, or they can go to the circuit court and seek review uh, by, by the circuit court. And what the reviews consist of, whether it's by court or by what we affectionately refer to as the PAC, because they used to be referred to and still are referred to the individuals as public access counselors, is whether the exemption asserted by the public body 
was appropriate. And in making that determination, the PAC or the court will look at the records in, in in-camera inspection, i.e. not disclosed to the requester, uh, and then the court or the PAC will decide whether the, inf- the exemption was properly asserted. In the vast majority of cases where there have been challenges to the city's responses to FOIA requests for years have been sustained. I can't give you a percentage, uh, but it's well over 50% have been sustained by the PAC. They are, and we've only had one case and it's pending now where somebody's gone to court uh, and the case is far from resolution. But the remedy and the people with the authority to decide whether information has been properly withheld or improperly withheld has been, or the responses have been timely or not timely is not you all. And is not- So Simon, if I understand you then, there is a way to remedy FOIA problems and there are two places to, to put it out. One is a straight out lawsuit and one is to refer to this PAC at the Attorney General's office. You are correct. Okay, so if that is true then, and we don't have you know, any authority on them, when it impacts us, then we have to change our rules because uh, they do their own assessment of when FOIA applies and where there is something that isn't uh, according to that law. Uh, Yes, but you have to be careful because I understand the people who have spoken today are suggesting that sworn police officers about whom complaints can be made pursuant to section 19-28, the introductory language, have been improperly withholding information or asserting exemptions. as I understand the way the police operate, it is not a sworn police officer who makes decisions on what's to be withheld and not withheld. It is Tony Weck, the police department's FOIA specialist. He is not a sworn police officer. Now, okay. officers may agree with that, but they aren't making those decisions. So, so I mean, that to me just says there's a line as to who you address to address complaints regarding FOIA. But I guess what I'm talking about is if FOIA deadlines and times of when they answer cause for somebody to have a complaint outside of our rules, then that is something that we can address because if, you know, just as, as you know, to, to have it be fair, if the person has information that they need in order to come before an appeal, then they should either get it or we stop the, t- the clock or some way make it so that they're, they don't get uh, cut out because of a deadline that they don't control. I, I, I appreciate that and I understand that. Uh, you and the requester in terms of timelines can adjust timelines. If it were me, I would file my complaint and indicate in the complaint that I have not been granted access to the records uh, because they have been FOIA'd, to use a phrase, and then ask for a delay in reviewing the complaint and any appeal connected with the complaint until the issue of raised by the FOIA response, the city's FOIA response, has been resolved. Either the records are ordered to be provided or not. That's how I personally, if I had a complaint uh, involving a sworn police officer uh, and there are records, that's how I would handle it. I'd file my complaint and I would acknowledge and say what I believe to be true under section in the process provided under section 19-28 and then ask for a delay 
so the request or the complainant can gather the information that he or she believes is necessary to so present. One last question then, because this, this is helpful. Um, we as the CPRB can change our operating rules as to this timeline, uh, or do we have to go to council to request those changes? If the timelines are in the ordinance, you must go to council. They must make the change. If they're clear within, if they are clearly stated and are not subject to confusion, then you must go to the council. Uh, I see Daryl has his hand up and, and Carol. Uh, no, also. I rescind that. I rescind okay. that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sure, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, I mean, this is turning into kind of a robust um, discussion and it's not on the agenda as such. And I think that suggestion had been made before we really got rolling with this, that there be a future agenda item about FOIA, which I think would be really helpful. And, um, and we can address some of these things about whether, whether um, the issues that are, are issues that need to be um, changed in the, um, in the ordinance about, time, uh, about timelines. And, um, and I think it would be actually a good foundation because we do have some appeals that relate to FOIA. So having that kind of basis before you go into those hearings might be useful. Be happy to make a note and put that on for a future agenda. Yeah. Let's, let's do that for the next meeting. And Carol, can I, would it be um, easy enough to take, let's say, the last uh, half dozen, let's say six FOIA requests and just give us the timeline, like uh, how long it took to, to get the information to the person making the request from the day that the request came in until the day that the information was sent. Do you mean random? Um, I was thinking the last six. Uh, but the last six random FOIA requests that the city has received? Um, okay, thank you. I, I see that I wasn't clear enough. I was thinking specifically in related to in relation to police complaints, um, okay. not not overall. So in relation to police, and I was thinking the last six, but but if you think a random six um, would be more instructive for us, uh, that's fine too. I think. Well, I think uh, one of the issues that will that will be that will be up here in in this is that not all timelines are the same for all requesters because if you become designated as a recurrent requester, then the timelines stretch out longer. So, um, you know, we, we can give some examples and then um, make those distinctions, but um, that's important because that, that yeah. act, that's relevant to this conversation. I think that, that would be good learning for us to, to, to make that distinction. And Mike, Mikhail, if I can uh, uh, mo uh, modify, the last six complaints won't necessarily have run out their time uh, yes, yeah. thank you. The last so six that have, do, that have if been. If we do blocked. that, we should do the last six appeals because then we have a full, uh, all the slots can be filled. Uh, well, okay. we don't necessarily have, we haven't necessarily crosswalked the FOIA requests with the appeals at this point because. Yeah, that's why it's better for the next meeting. And it, I, I, I was looking it up 19.29K is the section in the ordinance that talks about the timing and and you know to to just to, to put it to everybody if we look at that language and we look at the cases then we will know what to recommend to you know uh, to to counsel is you know especially when foia cases uh FOIA, FOIA overlap is is impacting some of those yeah okay All right. okay yeah, just 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 a, just a quick note. It seems to me as a section 1932B, just for board members to reference, uh, is where we'll land specifically regarding the. Appeal. You're very good at this, Scotty. You're probably better on it. Yeah, that's how. Well, there's, there's relevance to the complaints themselves, and then there's relevance to the appeals. So right. it's it, it it it's it's actually both both of you are right. It applies in two different sections. At I least thought we on, I thought we were on appeal, so I just tried to get back. There. So so we will have this as an agenda item for the next regular CPRB meeting, uh, and Carol will provide us information for two different categories uh, for a regular for the last 
you know, five, six uh, regular FOIA requests, and then you'll, you'll gather some information for us about uh, the timeline for uh, what you call frequent uh, requests. Recurrent, Recurrent, thank you. Um, and so we'll have that data to look at. Um, okay. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Any other um, comments or questions from the board uh, in regard to the current open appeals? Okay. Moving on to 6B, review of council recommendations, if any. Um, Ricardo? Um. Honestly, as I've been going through videos and some in which I, I, I was there and some of them aren't, I'm a, I'm a little, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm comprehensive and therefore I'm not sure if I can report back on, on everything. I think that the, that the salient part is not only today's members, but other people that have commented uh, at, at the council level, uh, they've been missing at uh, they've been mincing race and police uh, uh, reform onto it, and only some of it applies to us, uh, at least under present ordinance. I think that what I see is that uh, the council is several times uh, uh, saying, you know, that would be a good issue for CPRB, or we should hold off so that we can go back and give it to CPRB. So I guess what I'm, I, I haven't made the full listing, but I would uh, say that we should invite a member or council to, to, to help guide us on that so we all have the same info. Because right now I feel like what I have picked up uh, is colored just by how much I heard rather than what they concluded. Because to be fair, uh, those council meetings are very long. Um, and so when we're talking about this particular topic, you know, after third hour, I wane. After four hours, I am not there. You know, I put it in my thing and by then I've run out of batteries and whatever else. And so watching the video helps, but often I'll skip through to hear the end to see whether it actually concluded something or actually gave us uh, something. So I just want to put that back to say, we, we, we still need more than what I can provide today. Um, so, go ahead, Scott. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, Carol, I had uh, bugged the mayor about whether or not this board needed a city council rep sitting as a non-voting member as some other boards and commissions have. And I thought she was going to think about that and maybe mentioned legal. Um, is it appropriate for a city council meeting to be a member of this board? And if not, explain to me why we don't have one. I haven't spoken to her about that. So this is, this is new to me. I don't know if Jim has any, um, any thoughts on that. Okay. Um, and so we'll, I, I don't want to talk over him, but I, I did want to, I, I think I can help with, um, fill in a few blanks for Ricardo's um, summary when you, when, after Jim answers Scott's question. I have not been asked that question, but I don't see any reason if the mayor and the council deem it appropriate uh, that a council member not, I see nothing that blocks a council member from being uh, appointed to as a non-voting member, as you suggested the CPRB board. As you rightly said, there are other boards and commissions to which council members are present. And seeing that your appeals go no further than the CPRB, the council member would not be serving a dual role of sitting on the council and reviewing like a Supreme Court, so to speak, appeal. So, no. Yeah, okay. Well, I didn't want, thank you. I didn't want to derail the conversation, but it does speak directly to the conversation that we're having because the fact that we have a CPRB member who's apologizing for the fact that he hasn't been able to review all of city council meetings to figure out how they may impact us, you know, it just doesn't seem to be a very smooth system. And I know that they're very busy and obviously this board's up its ante on meetings. 
but uh, I would just ask uh, that that uh, admin and staff consider that, please. Well, I, I, um, until or maybe instead of, uh, does it make sense for somebody on this board to volunteer to be a liaison to council so that when we need to have direct communication about council decisions or deliberations or anything, uh, there's a single point of contact and, and that per person, uh, you know, potentially Scott, uh, just knows to reach out to to council and, and say, hey. <laughs> that, was, that was fly. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm not going to offer to do that. I think <laughs> your management function for us in this context. Um, uh, in other groups, what we do is we just take turns and it okay. for the information to be spotty but at least it gives us, because sometimes they'll meet twice a week. In the three hours, it, it can be, you know. I, I want to be clear. I not wasn't all of them are, are, are relevant to us, but I'm just I saying. wasn't suggesting that this person make a commitment to attend every minute of every council meeting. I was suggesting that this person um, knows that every Wednesday, uh, they're going to check in with somebody in council to see if there's something that we need to know about, about their work. Okay. Um, Actually, Mikhail, uh, this sounds like a perfect role for the, for the chair. <laughs> Just saying, um, but we'll see. Okay. Okay, Carol. So, um, just to fill in a little bit of um, maybe what um, Ricardo hadn't had the benefit of, of seeing is there was a discussion that there was a discussion at council that followed the special meeting that they had that, that was specifically to get feedback about um, you know uh, public safety reform and and um, changes that people were wanting in, in um, policing in Urbana. And um, what, the, what came out of that was a proposal from the mayor to have an advisory committee. And I think, you know, there, there was, I don't want to say there was unanimous support on the council for that. There was not. Some people want, they, they, they feel that that's something that is um, not, uh, not uh, efficient enough, that we should be taking action rather than study and so forth. However, there, there is some support on the council. The mayor is going to bring back um, an ordinance um, that would uh, establish that advisory committee. Um, we've been uh, meeting about it internally, trying to you know organize um, a, a around like what would the 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 idea would be that there would be this umbrella advisory committee, and then there would be subcommittees that would dig into a particular topic. And I can tell you that civilian um, oversight of police is one of those kind of dig in topics for a subcommittee. And, um, and I don't know if that would be something where the CPRB would, would largely be that subcommittee with some additional people, or whether there would be a representative from CPRB that would, that would engage on that. That remains to be seen. But what I, but what I will say is, um, you know, I think there's, you know, there, there are proposals out there to change the model. And, um, and that has a lot of implications and, and, and people recognize that. I think they recognize that um, other models are not, um, are not possible right now under the collective bargaining agreement with the federal um, FOP. Um, there are um, resource ramifications. So this, this was the impetus actually to have impetus behind one of the, one of the things under announcements was inviting this gentleman, Richard Rosenthal, who is an expert in civilian oversight models. And um, I'll, the, the, the actual date that's in the, in the agenda here has, has been postponed because of changes in, in the council agenda. But the idea is to have the council as the, as sort of the, the driver of, of some of these conversations to decide, um, okay, how should we be attacking this, uh, this particular issue, um, given all the, all the parameters that, that are really in play, which again are, you know, resources and the fact that the only model that, it, that is, um, 
that would be permitted with our current collective bargaining agreement is the model that we have. So, um, so I, I just say all that to say this is very much a live conversation and, um, and there'll be more to come on it. So I, to, to add to that, I had uh, mentioned to Mikhail because I, I was there when, when the, the mayor proposed uh, the, the, the council and I said to myself, where's the CPRB? So I went to Mikhail and said, it's coming. We need to figure out where, uh, where we play into that because we not only are we affected by the model, but given that that takes a bunch of a lot more inputs than what we presently have, then we should be present along the way because there are some things that are already uh, in ordinance for us that we that we can be changing. And you know, the, the next discussion that we have on the agenda, I think, is part of of that because as we uh, attempt some of the changes, there will be times at which we're blocked because ordinance doesn't give us that, or we just look at the practical and say, you know, as, a, as, a, as, as regular residents confronting this kind of stuff, either we have much more to say or we have uh, to withdraw for various reasons. And I, and I have to clarify, not by the amount of work, We've already talked about how difficult it's become for us to keep track of everything, uh, but there, you know, it, it's hard. It's just personal life is affected by the hours that you spend with regular people, with the groups, and with the official uh, city uh, machines that run different aspects. So for me, I can see very well that we should be part of that discussion with the mayor. Or, uh, or with council by the time it finalizes, but right now it is cooking. And in fact, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to also to say, yes, we want to be part of it and recommend that we are because we don't know what the time commitment is. And there are some things that are only us and some that will be there that aren't now in our present mix. So anyway. So that's the report right now. My recommendation is that we, we do show up, uh, you know, as we decide who to represent us, uh, but also on the side, the mayor is the one that appointed us that we should put ourselves in a, in a, in a more formal way to say, we are quite aware that this will have impact us. So, so our members are willing and able. All right. Thank you, Ricardo. Moving on to New business, um, there are two items. The first one is to confirm the date for the de-escalation training with Mike Slosser from the Illinois Police Training Institute. Um, and in response to, uh, to Chris's public comments, uh, yeah, my understanding is also that, uh, that Mike is doing us a favor um, and is not being paid for his work. So we do appreciate him coming in. Um, uh, we're, we're asking Mike to do this as an intentional uh, alternative to asking somebody uh, in Urbana police uh, to, to tell us about, to talk to us about how they train their, their staff, their officers. So, uh, you, you know, for other parts of our training, we certainly want to, and we are, uh, going outside of the police to get the training we need. But in terms of understanding how they do their jobs, uh, for that, it makes sense for us to go directly to the police. But even here, we, we you know, just to eliminate a little bit of bias, uh, we asked Mike and, and he's kind enough to, to come. So I, I, I think, you know, I'm happy to have him talk to us. And, and then uh, as it becomes clear that there are things that we, that we want to know about that we're not getting from him. Uh, let's identify those things and then let's figure out who can, who can talk to us about that. Um, so Car Carol, we have a proposed date for that? We do and that's, um, that's under the announcement section and it's September 3rd. That would be um, a special meeting of the um, CPRB and I think, I think you would want to handle it similar to what you did with the um, use of force training, which is minimize the number of other agenda items and get him, get him um, 
get them going quite quickly um, to, to get through the material and to let them begin on time. So um, I had done a doodle poll um, looking for times for the appeals hearings. And then um, we had been talking to Mike separately because he had volunteered when he did that use of force training to do the de-escalation. And he suggested the third and people were lining up on the third for the doodle poll. So I was like, okay, well, let's see if this could all work. Um, I don't know everyone's availability, um, but I wanted to just offer that. Um, and if it works, then we can confirm that with everybody. Um, you want us to go down the line and like, you know, that'd be great. Um, okay. Um, can we, Tamara, would you just kind of do it as a roll call then? Sure. Tony? W would that be at 530? Yes. Uh, yes, that, that works. Cardo? Yes. Scott? I already have it in my calendar. Katrina? Yes. Mikhail? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Megan? Yes. And Daryl? Muted. All right. Yes. So it looks like it's good to go. Okay, and um, and we know Jason, I, I talked to Jason, so he's available to Zoom it for everyone and um, we'll, we'll lock it down. Thank you. All right, so thank you. I wanna make a, a parenthesis on this. Uh, I, I, I recognize that, I recognize too, in agreement, I think with Christopher, uh, having a particular person come and feed us information is always a, a kind of only one aspect. Uh, and especially in Mike's situation that he's coming back to back, we, uh, the, both the, the Naleo that Scott has been going to, but I have been keeping track of too. Uh, you need people that know, in this case, he knows what's being taught. But the other thing that happened to me just coincidence on campus i had been invited to the de-escalation training also on campus and when i saw the name of who was training i said oh but i don't have to go anywhere else i won't you know <laughs> i'll just go to one uh and that's ours uh so this is the same information in a way that's happening on campus except that the campus one is also you have to enforce building rules and you know there's somebody that's not going to want to follow the rules as they want to come in business and they have to learn the escalation and so right now there is a great need for this i think for everybody so i think the public uh this is a, this is one in which we can all help out to make it better uh because there are a lot of unusually unusual situations in which we're being asked to 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 fall in line and we may not be happy about it ourselves so we may be on the receiving end of somebody's technique and we have to know what it is and, and help out. Yes, thank you, Ricardo. Um, all right, where are we? We are, uh, yep, so we've confirmed the date and now we're ready to move into the discussion of the first-hand account language in section 1928. Uh, and before we do that, uh, I'll just say a few words to introduce both the new members to, to just kind of give you the context for this conversation and also respond to, um, uh, to something that was said during public comment, which is why did we put this language into the, the revised complaint form? Um, so we did that because we were aware that this was city policy. So this was already happening and we just wanted the form to, to um, uh, reflect the reality of what was happening. It was not our intention to, um, to, to put a stamp of approval on that policy. It was always our intention to, to uh, create an agenda item and for us to have a formal discussion of that. And so, uh, so that's where we are now is we're ready to engage in that discussion uh, and 
the form was just reflecting the policy at the time. Um, Ricardo, do you want to say something else in terms of introducing the discussion and then we'll open it up? You're on mute. Thank you. Um, so I think we should read the ordinance and then what, what, what the form came out as uh, because I, I uh, we're putting it on the agenda I, at our bequest. I think Mikhail and I were talking about it. We were going over also comments from previous public uh, uh, input. And I believe uh, in this case, um, I'm trying to go back. I think uh, it was Tracy that we were uh, also communicating about this. Uh, and so uh, there's only so much we can discuss on the side. So anyway, so I'm reading straight off the ordinance, uh, investigation and mediation, section 19-28. Kate reading this, it makes me feel like the lawyer that I did not become because I didn't want to. Um, uh, for the purpose of this division, a complaint is written is a written allegation of misconduct lodged against a sworn police officer. A, complaints concerning police conduct may be filled at the police department or the Urbana Human Relations Office. Later on, Scotty and I have been talking about, we need to go through our internal rules because at the time they reflected what this ordinance said, but we will have to come back and put on the agenda that we review what our internal policy became after this. But anyway, B, complaints shall be made in writing using a citizen complaint form created by the CPRB in cooperation with the chief of police. I don't know if we did that as much the last time. A complainant shall be furnished with information regarding the complaint process and the rights of complainants prior to or as part of the filing process. And then here it comes. A complaint shall be a sworn statement attesting to the truthfulness of the allegations made. Complaint form shall contain a written statement that anyone making willfully or intentionally false allegations within the sworn complaint may be subject to prosecution. An explanatory explanatory statement shall state that a finding that the that a finding that the complainant is unfounded or not sustained shall not necessarily be construed as a false statement d complaint shall be based upon a first-hand account either by the person involved in the incident or a witness to the incident except that a minor shall be represented by a parent or guardian in all matters pertaining to the complaint uh, I think Megan especially, uh, this one, E says, complainants may opt to dictate complaints to HRO. Dictated complaints must be read back to the complainant, verified by the complainant and signed by the complainant. F, complainants shall receive a copy of the submitted complaint at, at the time of filing. And then we go on to the dates and other stuff. But that's what the ordinance said. Uh, and darn it, I didn't have time to pull up the form so that we know the where we are with the new form. Um, I had it under my mail pull out, but now it's a good place. Uh, I've got it open. I can read it if Excellent. you Excellent. Thank uh, you for the under, help. Under directions and information, uh, it says, please fill out this form to file an official complaint against an Urbana police officer. In order to file this complaint, you need to have been physically present when and where the alleged misconduct occurred. With some exceptions, this, the incident must have occurred within the past 45 working days. That's the first paragraph. For everybody's background, that form was, uh, was uh, approved at our last meeting. So it was in the minutes. I hope you, you got to see them, but this form in this language was approved. And therefore, the, the, the complaint at that meeting, complaint, the feedback for, from that meeting, and I think it, it carries on to today, is uh, that's not the exact language. And therefore, you are implying, uh, you are requiring more on the form than on the, on the, on the, on the ordinance. And I might as well bring it up. And especially as it relates to video, is video not a first-hand uh, uh, witness of what happened and therefore a person can use a video 
to put in a complaint. Uh, so just to, to help out our discussion, because it's really hard to, to keep track of it all, uh, I'll just point out A, B, C. Uh, in, in terms of a complaint, there is the person that, 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 uh, that did the action and then the person receiving the action. So person A, in this case, would be police. Person B would be the one that is a receiving whatever the person then. So B would be a complainant or, or the receiver of the action by the police. And C would be, and I think that, that that's where the, the big issue comes, what qualifies as, 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 as person C because person C could be a witness that was not physically present or was physically present uh, uh, or was video present. And I, I'd like to acknowledge right off because it gets really hairy. We would not be specifying so much if there were not videos in everybody's hands now and atrocities across the nation would never have been called them because the videos didn't exist before and so people weren't believed. Now when a video comes out, the video supports and brings out a whole uh, 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 witnessing that didn't exist before. But in our situation, we have a discrepancy from people's views, but it really hinges for now, and who knows what other technology, on the fact that person A, police, has a video at least in almost every case for us in the city. Person B may or may not have a video. They're the ones being uh, uh, reacting to the police action. And sometimes they do have a video. And three, uh, uh, person C would normally be witness, would be a person that was there and, and has witnessed physically what has happened. Does person C include a video and there's other implications, but I just want to put that forward so we can talk about it. But it's easier to talk about it. So anyway, that, that's my intro and it's really hard. I have been trying, I've been hurting my brain as I talk to other people because the, the scenarios are, are hard to process under the old rules. I mean, it, it seems like firsthand account is more expansive than physically present uh, as, a, as a witness. Um, uh, firsthand account, it's not defined in the ordinance, um, which is an issue. I mean, there's no definitions in the ordinance. Um, I see that there's definitions in the policies and procedures, um, but I, you know, a, the difference, what's the difference between a person watching an incident from their window and a person and a, a person uh, video and a, and a camera taking their place and that person watching uh, from a, a third location uh, via that same video. Um, it, the requirements are video or audio. Um, so the person doesn't necessarily have to hear anything. Um, you, I, th I think we run into ADA issues if you had to require someone to hear something. Um, so I, I think the the ordinance is more expansive than, than what we're requiring in the form, as far as, as I can tell. I mean, a, a video uh, to, to point out to uh, what Miss, um, um, I'm forgetting her name, Miss oh, McClintock said, the, the video is, is entered into evidence in court cases uh, every day. It's, a, it's considered a silent witness. Um, that's the theory that it gets put in under. And as long as it's uh, reliable, it's, it's substantive, meaning it's, it comes in as if, uh, and it can be considered just like any other evidence, just like the officer who were to testify at a, at a hearing or, or the uh, complaint filer. So um, I, I think, you know, as much as, you know, the, the implications would be, well, we would get a, a lot more complaints. I think that that's what the ordinance seems to allow. The, the issue of too many complaints is a is a real issue in the sense that you know there there there's a limited number of staff hours and a limited number of actually 
you know, police investigative hours, and it, it's possible uh, for that to get really overwhelmed. However, I would say that that should not be the guiding principle under which we make a decision, because sure. there are other strategies through which, um, you know, complaints that come from a single video could probably be bundled into, you know, sort of a, I don't know, group action, um, you know, so that there wouldn't necessarily be any more work on the part of city staff. Uh, if there's one complaint from a video or if there are 101. Uh, so I, I, I hope that we can, can think about, uh, you know, the, the benefits and potential limitations of, of allowing video to, um, to start a complaint process separate from whatever logistical challenges it might cause, because I do think there are other solutions to those. I mean, it, if we, if we were concerned about too many complaints, then I think the ordinance would have said that you couldn't have a, a witness who wasn't on the receiving end of alleged misconduct be able to file. But, you know, if there are 100 people witnessing this event and they happen to be there, yeah, I think that would all get bundled, as, you, as you're stating, Mikhail, into one review. So, you know, the fact that 100 people see it on a video is, it, it's, you get the same result. Just um, thought, me, Tony. I, I had not considered a hundred people uh, being physically present, but definitely. Uh, I, I mean, that could happen. It's it's that's, quite it, possible. That's right, uh, and therefore, then the, the the video part is it, it's it, irrelevant. It that's right because it's parallel to a situation. Uh, let me ask you because I am I am not a lawyer, but uh, when it comes to video in a courtroom. Uh, you, you called it, it's, it's classified as a silent witness. That's a, it's a way to get the evidence in. That's what I mean. And so is, is evidence different than a person sitting there? Because it seems to me like we use many things as evidence that don't necessarily, uh, in fact, that we impede a person from interpreting the evidence. It says, this is what the evidence says. It was there. It was a bloody knife or whatever. The evidence is there, but we don't say just anybody can come and say that the bloody knife is saying this or not. You sure. I mean? So, I mean, it, you know, it, in that uh, if you're allowing video to come in under that theory, um, there are limitations as to who can what can be described about what's happening. Um, a, a, and I, a, an example would be, uh, you know, a surveillance video at a, at a Walmart or, or a retail store. If no one is actually watching it, um, as it happened, it's just recording. No one happens to see it at the same time that no one can come in and describe, this is what is going on here. It's, it's for the viewer that, you know, in that case, a decider of fact to, to just determine what it is. But we got another lawyer here, so uh, you know I'm sure we've got a different opinion, maybe. Well, <laughs> if there's two could, lawyers, there's always could, 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 could I uh, speak to that, please, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Daryl, please. Okay, uh, I, I must say first that I do agree with Tony and very, very everything that he has said. Uh, if we're thinking about a situation where there's an altercation down there on the street, and I see it from my window and at the same time take a video of it with my phone. Uh, I, I can see the video uh, being used by our board as evidence of what happened. But still, I'm going to have to appear as a witness to authenticate that video to say, yes, uh, this video truly and accurately shows what was going on at that time. Uh, that's, my, that's, my, that's my take on it. That is true. Go ahead, Jim. Thank I would you, agree with uh, Daryl's analysis 100%. Videos are having been a litigation attorney for several decades and having dealt with video in the courtroom. Videos just don't come in on anybody's uh, say so or presentation of the evidence. The video, as Tony, would probably agree if he's you've done litigation i assume plenty of yes. it, 
uh, has to be authenticated. And the person who usually authenticates the video, if available, is the videographer. Because the videographer was present at the incident during which the video was taken. Video is a very powerful tool and it also can have a, you know, a good solid weight on a jury or a judge called the trier of fact. So the video has to be authenticated and that is done by the person who took the video. If you want to get into abstractions, let's say there is a reporter, a news reporter with his or her cameraman present at a scene and you're at home watching the incident live on television and you pull out your cell phone and record it. That cell phone recording could only be admitted under a circumstance where the owner of that phone, the person who used it, says, yes, I recorded what I saw on TV uh, with my cell phone. It would not be admitted specifically to prove the truth of the matter depicted or asserted therein because then you get into hearsay and double hearsay. But the witness, in fact, your ordinance, section D, as was read, says that it's a firsthand account uh, by a person involved in the incident or a witness to the incident. With all due respect to various comments about what firsthand account means, Dictionary definitions describe firsthand accounts as people who are present or participants in an incident as opposed to secondhand accounts. I can probably go through six or seven cases right now, both federal and state cases, that basically provide that, first of all, firsthand accounts are people who are present, who actually have eyewitness presence at the event. Or they are lit, or they are the term firsthand account is synonymous with uh, a personal account. Requires somebody present, somebody who observes somebody else's video, can testify what they observed on the video, but that does not cannot be considered evidence of what actually happened at the incident. And I know I'm getting very much in the weeds on this, and it is complex. Uh, lawyers, as Tony will tell you, have argued for centuries, going back to merry old England, as to what constitutes hearsay evidence and whether or not it will be admissible in a court of law. So why this- different, I, mean, I appreciate what you're saying. And in, in the context of evidence, uh, it makes sense. Uh, you know, everything that you're saying, like I, I can see the good reasons, but we have a different threshold here. We're not talking about whether the video should be allowed as evidence. We are simply considering whether somebody who, who watches an event take place on a video has the ability to initiate a complaint process that begins an investigation. The complaint process triggers an investigation that is designed to gather evidence that is then reviewed. I agree with you. The only problem with that is the language in your ordinance. Now, if the language in the ordinance doesn't work because it says the complaint, not the investigation, not the presentation, if there's an appeal where people are putting things into so-called evidence, it says complaints shall be based on firsthand knowledge. So it has to be at the stage of the complaint where the firsthand knowledge is uh, provided. Uh, if you all want to change that language, then you would have to go, because it would be an amendment to the uh, ordinance, you'd have to go to the council to change it. I'm not speaking that this should be what, that this should remain. I'm saying that is what the ordinance says as currently written, written. And if the council is so inclined to change it and you can convince them to change it to something else, that's fine. I mean, what you want in your complaint. 
Uh, you may want to go to a probable cause standard as opposed to an, a firsthand account standard or personal eyewitness type present. That, that's up to you and the council. That, that's a policy decision. That's not a legal decision. But as written, complaints shall be based on firsthand knowledge. Tony, so, does that contradict what you said? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Didn't you just say that it's more expensive on the ordinance side? I, I thought it read more expansive on the on the ordinance side for firsthand account because it says either the person there or or a witness to the incident. And if we're talking about, um, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about, as Mikhail said, a, uh, a, a threshold for standing, whether that person has standing to file the complaint based on this account by a witness, uh, you know, a video can be a witness to the event. But the person watching the video is not a witness to the event. They are a witness to the video that depicts the event. Sure. I mean, I'm not saying that you're but wrong. Someone could submit, someone could submit the complaint uh, on the video's behalf. If, I mean, if we, I mean. It would be the videographer's behalf. Well, no, I mean, you don't need the videographer always. You can, as long as the recording, you can bring in the person who can testify to whether the equipment is functioning correctly. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it's yeah. a videographer. No, here, that, that, that gets into a technical analysis. Right, I mean, we're- it, As of the day, the it was operated. I guess the, the problem would be is maybe you have the complainant or the person who's on the receiving end of uh, potential misconduct Physical witness. The B person. I'm sorry? Person. The B person that Ricardo, I believe, is right. hypothetical. You have, I guess, maybe everyone there at the scene physically present that doesn't want to come forward, um, but you have video of it and you have this going or being seen by other members of the community and wondering why there isn't, if this isn't being addressed. And, you know, it's because uh, the people there don't want to file a complaint or for whatever reason, don't want to be involved. So uh, Agreed. I'm not saying that your concept is wrong. I'm saying it doesn't comport right now with the language in the ordinance. Okay. Mr. I think Chairman. You need a, if you want to change it, you need an ordinance change. Uh, let's, let's go to Scott and, and then I think Daryl wants okay, to say thanks. something as well. Hi, Katrina. I see you too. too. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, insert a couple of cautions here. Uh, and I'm going to get off of this current line of argument that we have, uh, which I'm not sure is productive, uh, although educational. Um, I wouldn't make any assumptions about bundling complaints. If you had heard and you paid attention to the language used in public participation, your in instinct, your spidey sense should be tingling about the context of bundling multiple complaints around the videos. Had a long discussion at one of the last couple of meetings about um, uh, a, a list of uh, various uh, offenses uh, that could qualify or which would be included as uh, rationale for complaints. Uh, Carol presented a list. And in fact, at some point in time, we got to a list where, and I'm paraphrasing terribly, and I tried to look in my notes and I can't find uh, uh, Carol's list, um, that someone felt as if a police officer had used um, negative language. Uh, and this board came back uh, and wanted that added back to the list of things that people should full well feel they could issue a complaint about. So first of all, uh, uh, since I'm multiplying things here, uh, from the Aaliyah Lewis case, I think we've got at least three or four chunks of video. So you have multiple videos from multiple perspectives, from multiple uh, uh, witnesses at this point. Uh, these are all coming into the board uh, in an environment where we have said if an individual feels offended by an action by an urbana police officer, that is a legitimate complaint. 
Um, and in the context of the uh, Lewis case, uh, I spent four hours and submitted kind of my own little uh, sort of technical uh, critique of that. I found four or five instances that I thought were, you know, kind of hardcore bad policy, uh, let alone uh, things that could be expanded to the way language was used. Uh, and so uh, I just don't think bundling will work. And that should be off the table. If um, we allow videos to be a primary source for complaints, then there is the distinct possibility that in an environment where we have uh, antagonistic relationships with members of the community, we will get dumped on. And uh, I will say it again, although I was admonished in the second public comment last time, throughput is of concern here. Uh, and um, um, I just don't think the bundling thing is going to work. Uh, so anyway, that's that was what I wanted to throw in. Uh, Daryl and then Katrina. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to uh, make a remark that this discussion should give you uh, a greater appreciation of what a judge has to do in listening to the arguments of three different lawyers, myself and Mr. Simon and, and Tony. Uh, it's a daunting task. That's all I really wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. I'm sure those gentlemen will agree. Yeah, usually it's only two. You got to deal with three of us. <laughs> oh, you, sometimes the guardian of the light. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you've got a jail. Right. <laughs> My question is, um, when, um, James or Jim had said about the authenticating of the of the video from the videographer. How does um, the board look at it when you have various videographers at the same place with different angles coming with a complaint? How does how has that been handled? Because technically, who do you decide which video is is more authenticated than the other one? if they were all there at the same time for that firsthand experience, but we got different angles, which one supersedes the other one if they all bring a complaint on what's happened being video? Does that I'm make sense? Sure that, I'm not sure that has happened, but if it did, um, I think uh, what should happen is that the city staff should, should accept and process each complaint um, and and each should uh, receive a findings letter based on the resulting investigation. But you bring up a good point, Katrina. I just want to speak out of turn maybe, but uh, we have never, speaking to the threshold, we have never required the police officer who wore the camera or held the taser mm -hmm. to authenticate the video that was taken when they carried the instrument. Uh, to do. We have just watched the videos and considered them as witnesses to the situation. So what you apply to the police, how to apply to the public when it comes to uh, to our procedure on that. But I, uh, after this, I, I, I want to bring a real situation because it's been mm -hmm. me. That's the one that's actually kept me awake. But go ahead. And I think the reason that I that I pose that question is because of social media and when things have been occurring, you can go on to uh, a Snapchat and see a little bit of the snippet and then another person is there and they'll post it on Facebook and then you'll see another person and they'll put something on another part of, of social media, but they all were in the same place getting different angles that could lead to a complaint and if you're not ready for the complaint, like you said, it hasn't happened. And I'm one of those people that plan for the A, the B, and the C. I might not ever get to the C, but I've planned for the A, the B, and the C. Because once or if it happens and you're kind of scrambling on, well, what should we have done? or what, And then that, that could add to the person's 
that is making the complaint that you could possibly have taken too long to rectify or help them with the answer that they're needing. I talk with my hands a lot, so sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Uh, to answer Katrina's I fundamental question, if, let's say there are five videos, five different people, five different angles, depicting different parts of the incident. Maybe there's some overlap. All, if all, if all five videos are authenticated by whomever, at least initially, they have equal weight in a courtroom. They're admitted into evidence, period. Now, the next question though becomes, and that's where, uh, you know, the power in a courtroom of cross-examination, which, you know, the greatest minds in, in, on the Supreme Court have acknowledged that cross-examination is how you really get to the truth. But then it becomes a matter of credibility of the, of the person who ha took the video, whether it was in any way manipulated, whether it was shot in a way to describe a scene in an exaggerated form, whatever, all kinds of questions are typically asked uh, of videographers of the person who authenticated the video. Now it's no different than, now you get into what your thoughts have been on this as a group. N now that the videos are in evidence, so to speak, it becomes a matter, just like witnesses, get on the stand in a courtroom and they put their uh, evidence into test or their testimony into evidence, it then becomes a matter of credibility of the witnesses testing through cross examination. Okay, and then this, the prior this, effect, you all or the judge or the hearing officer has to decide what it, what is more credible than the other. I can't tell you what is or isn't. That's for you to decide when you hear it all. And, and, and that's not our question right now. We we are not considering the credibility of evidence. We're just considering whether, um, as Tony said, somebody has standing to initiate a complaint, which will in turn initiate an investigation. I understand, I was just answering Katrina's yeah, opening right. question on authentication and what happens if you have two videos. And as I said, in response to that, you, you're bound for the moment by the language in the ordinance. Well, except that there's, that, that even in this very small room where there are only a handful of us, there are three lawyers that are not interpreting the ordinance in the same way. So, so I appreciate your interpretation. I, I, I give way to it, um, but I also hear that, that it's, you know, that it's not, uh, that there's some disagreement about it. Um, so it, it may be that, that we need to go to council and say, uh, the ordinance is, so here's the thing for me. I think that if we put aside the ordinance for a moment and ask the question, what is in the public interest? What it seems to me clearly in the public interest is for there to be an investigation when there's a video that is showing the possibility of misconduct. I, 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 you know, I agree, and, and you're approaching it exactly the right way. Let's take for the moment the ordinance out of it, as you say, and what, what do you want to achieve? And your accountability to the public, how do you want to address that? Once you have decided that, you can then propose or craft language to accomplish what you think is appropriate. But for the moment, you've got an ordinance, but your approach, Mikhail, is spot on. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, actually, let's go to Scott and, and then Ricardo. Yeah, Scott. Uh, yeah, just uh, remembering that um, the issuance of the complaint, I, I understand, I think, where you and Jim agree on, Mikhail, but. Um, you know, this board might make a recommendation at the process of the end of this process 
for a disciplinary action or dismissal uh, of a police officer. Um, and so I think as we think about the rules of evidence or whatever we want to call that, we need to, we need to keep that in mind. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, say that this board has a duplicity of interests um, that we are also responsible for the fair treatment of the police officers in the city of Urbana, as well as the citizens. And I don't believe that's an untenable situation. I think that's something that we can do. Um, but certainly when it comes to the UFOP agreement and all that, there are some hard stops here. And before we spend uh, too much time, we just need to integrate all of that. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Scott. Uh, in fact, uh, so you brought person A into back into the picture uh, and and we were talking about person C, but let me give you a situation that, that came through that, that, that's been rolling and that is this, person B. What if we allow, let's, let's just suspend the, 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 where we were, uh, and we said, yes, video is a witness. We do it through city council, whatever else. That thus then uh, gets to Tony's point, that person has standing if they have a video, uh, but, whatever we do is we need to make sure that person B, the person that feels offended is respected in this way. If person B is who has felt the offense and wants to uh, put in their complaint, they're the ones that should have the first leg on putting in a complaint. Uh, if there's a person C, a witness that wants to put in a complaint, it's treated as their complaint, but person B, the one that was offense to directly uh, by the action of person A, the officer, should not have any less uh, protection. Because I think there are times, and, and, and we don't have to put them into a, a particular case yet, but I think it happens. Person B wants to complain. They put in a complaint against the officer, but that's where they want to stop. They just want to mark the fact that I did not think this was fair. Whatever the police chief says, they're not even seeking so much, but they just want to make sure that it, ha that it is marked that an officer treated me badly. If they don't appeal, then that's their prerogative. If they withdraw their complaint or just receive the letter, that's their prerogative. And I'm speaking now because if person C wants to put in a complaint and wants to take it to appeal because they're not happy with the police chief's findings, I, have a, I am very uncomfortable to put that over person B. Person B deserves the privacy of not being brought up by a person C. And they deserve the respect of what their wishes are as to what the quote conclusion of when this matter doesn't further advance. So for me, uh, whatever we do in the public's interest, especially person B, the person that feels that they were mishandled by police ought to have the, the, the closure position whichever it may be. They may be in, in agreement to carry the complaint further, but when it comes to us, we should never take a person C, video or not, further than what person B would want to be, at least when it comes to the discipline and to person A, you know, what is, the, what is discipline on the officer? Because person B is the one that received the situation and whatever their background is, I just feel like they should have priority. And I don't know what to do with that if you, if you expand person C's possibilities with a video because the chance of that occurring is more likely because you will have lots of persons with videos uh, authenticated or not because it's a lot easier to do. Person B offended is 
relevant. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, Ricardo. Like I, I, I totally hear your concern for the well-being of, of the person who was directly impacted by, in this case, um, you know, potential police misconduct. Um, and I can see the good reasons why we would want to prioritize their well-being. Uh, and at the same time, we can probably all imagine a variety of reasons why a person might be afraid to submit complaints or, uh, or appeal a complaint that was submitted uh, or just not wanting to attract attention to themselves, right? Uh, and it, in those cases, there's probably still a public interest to, you know, to be able to investigate and find out what happened and if there's any kind of misconduct. Protect them somehow. Um, and and so the remedy might be that that if the person who's directly impacted, who's obviously an eyewitness to to what happened, you know, they're not compelled to participate in an interview or to provide any testimony. I assume they have the ability to opt out, which would certainly, um, you know, get in the way of a thorough investigation, uh, but still would allow an investigation to occur. Perhaps, as long as they have the option. Uh, Megan. Yeah, I, I just want to verify that I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with Mikkel on this one. And I just want to make sure that during this discussion, was Katrina's the original part, the first part of Katrina's question about, you know, the processing of the complaints by various witnesses was, did we really answer that? It seemed like we answered the, that the attorney answered the second part, but I just want to make sure that Katrina's first part, that the complaints will be all processed in kind of a similar fashion, that that was addressed. And I'm sorry, but I, I kind of feel like it kind of was left hanging. And I just want to make sure that we do address that. Because I think I agree with Kat Katrina that that is also important. Yeah, thank you. It, it, I try to respond to that. Uh, as long as, well, I mean, we're, we're discussing whether video is sufficient or people have to be physically present. But as long as a person has standing to file a complaint, um, you know, the, the city will process and we will have the ability to review all five complaints. Yeah, I was going to try to address something to Katrina that you talked about multiple perspectives on the videos. It's pretty common. It actually, it used to be, <laughs> you know, we would, we'd review a case and there would be uh, five squad cars responding to an incident from, you know, vastly different angles as they approach uh, the civic center uh, from different streets. Um, and we never really had a way to weight those. Uh, we got used to looking at perspectives as the car moved down the street and it approached the incident and you could see the people that were <laughs> in the incident. But that's about as analytical as we ever got about that. Uh, so for example, if it was a sergeant's car, that video didn't get weighted any differently than a patrol officer's. Uh, car. Uh, I think you were speaking mostly to the multiple uh, witnesses like we're talking now, but that is the one case where you've had to deal with what is reality in the in the video. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, comment on, uh, and this is uh, in response to a little bit of Ricardo's uh, questioning line, um, uh, and I, I think what I heard you say, Ricardo, is that um, we just take, we take whatever kind of video that we get from UPD. Uh, and so maybe we, you know, should we just take any kind of video that we get from the public? Maybe that's not what you said. 
Um, so I can just cast my comment uh, in a reminder that I'm sure if we had uh, Chief Seraph and here are uh, one of the sergeants, they could tell us about the highly detailed and um, time consumptive uh, record that they keep from videos. So the video product that we get from the police is really time and data acquisition stamped in a way that we're not going to be able to expect you know, cell phones to be able to produce. And uh, I, I can't help but think that in terms of, you know, evidentiary sort of aspects, uh, as a result, you know, m might be treated differently uh, as, as something like this move, move forward. So uh, there's a I lot. I guess I'm just saying fairness, Scott, when it comes to that, if we're not doing it on one end, we shouldn't do it on the other end to the same level. I, while I agree that there is a procedure within police. Maybe I've seen enough movies to know that things can be manipulated if they really wanted to. I think our job is to be fair and thorough and to hold the police to the same standard we would hold uh, 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 another person. And at times it may be that we want to see how that time stamp works so that nobody fudged. Uh, if we don't have that kind of, uh, uh, of incredulity, uh, then we, I, I feel like we would be uh, ceding to some of the public suspicions. So I'm not saying that we have to uh, be as, as uh, uh, that we have to be unfair. We just have to take things with the same kind of fairness on, on both directions if we choose to do it. Yeah, I, th I, th I think I think that it's okay to say that we would expect more out of a video product uh, product from the police. There you go. Because the body cams and the in car video, you know, the way these guys warehouse this stuff and move it around uh, is all very tightly controlled. Um, uh, so I'm I'm actually wouldn't claim any kind of e equivalence. I just wanted. Um, uh, to talk a little bit about how their video evidence is a little different than I think you're going to get from cell phones, you know, well, on the street. Again, our question here is is just who has the standing to to initiate a complaint? Right. Um, so, so I'd like to put something else on the table. Again, coming back to the question of what's in the public interest, and I think it is definitely in the public interest for there to be an investigation. Um, I can see a different uh, uh, mechanism to initiate that investigation than, uh, than some kind of reinterpretation or revision of the ordinance that allows for uh, video to give people standing. Uh, and that other alternative is one that I presented either a month or two ago, which is that the CPRB um, becomes the complainant. So citizens have the ability to make video available to us. And upon review of the video, if there, is no, if there are no citizen complaints, then the CPRB can initiate a complaint that initiates an investigation. Um, so I just wanna put that for our consideration, again, as a way of going forward, because it, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me that that there's some kind of incident that occurs that is videotaped and there's no mechanism to begin an investigation when it's clear to people watching it that, you know, we need to understand what happened here. Yeah, that's it, it, it to process that because it's not a complaint, it's a complaint appeal. We would ask the chief to investigate and to report back as to what of what he sees, right? Yeah, let's not. I, 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 I understand the point of yeah. there needs to be an investigation. That's it. I just want us to be able to initiate the investigation, which is what happens when there's a complaint. That's the only thing that happens when there's a complaint is that there's an investigation and then, you know, a findings letter that, that um, summarizes the, the results of that investigation. So that's what I want to initiate if 
if there's video uh, um, if there's video available that is not uh, you know where there's no other citizen complaint. Mm. That's really something to consider, uh, especially because that would clear up um, that third party. We we become that third party uh, to initiate the complaint, to at least represent the public's interest, to make sure that the the the, the chief initiates the the investigation. I have also seen that. The investigation results, the findings letter that you just mentioned, is um, I would say obtuse enough. It's just not, it's really hard to read without having a negative reaction because it, it, it either it, it, policy was, was, was uh, followed or not. And some things that are policy, as I've been reading now, the, 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 the policy manual, it, it fits policy. But darn it, was it fair or moral? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so there are times at which I think there needs to be further explanation rather than the official categories that we put that, that are there because it's really harsh. Um, it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's I agree. And, and I think in those cases when, you know, there's a difference between uh, two different questions, right? Was policy followed? And did harm occur? And and we can have a situation where policy was followed, and it's still things went wrong and harm happened. And I think what people are longing for is some kind of acknowledgement of that. You know, they don't want, you know, like I think people generally understand that law enforcement officers have a hard job to do. That they're responding with, you know, often to very minimal information. Um, you know, under you know very um, you know, stressful and sometimes life-threatening conditions. Um, and sometimes they're going to make mistakes. Um, and I think what, what people want is that when those mistakes happen, um, acknowledge them, express regret about them. You know, even if the people that made those mistakes, um, you know, were following policy, were doing, you know, their best job, you know, we're not trying to you know, this is this is not a criminal proceeding. It's just like, you know, people want some acknowledgement of the harm. So, what's our next step? What do we do with this? I, I, I know I've I've learned several things today, and I will yet learn more. But um, I think we are in the position that we need to come to a conclusion and to satisfy that public interest. And, uh, and and get to the point. So I think one of the things I'm hearing from you is consider that we would initiate under those, under a third party complaint, we would become the, the C uh, by decision, probably in, 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 in a meeting ju just as this, open. That's uh, right. and, and I would want that language to be in the ordinance so that, yeah. uh, so that everybody understands that that's our role and they can communicate to this body. Uh, and um, so I, I, think, I think the next step is, is some kind of motion to make a recommendation to council to either uh, revise the ordinance to, to explicitly include video testimony, not, not testimony, sorry, video, um, watching a video as, as uh, as standing to file a complaint. Either that or uh, change language of the ordinance that would allow the CPRB to, to initiate a, a, a police investigation. Megan. Um, I, I, I just wanna state that I, I agree with you. I think that we need to make certain um, that video is somehow addressed uh, moving forward because I, I don't think it's going away. And I think most of us would agree with that. And I think it is going to come into play in all the ways that we have discussed this evening more and more all the time. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So uh, 
thank you. I, I, I guess one thing we can do is um, we can we can continue the conversation, have a vote in the next meeting. And the only benefit of that is that the folks that are following along have the opportunity, you know, right now and at the beginning of the next meeting to to give us some more input and feedback. Uh, if that's something that that we we want at this point, then I guess that's a third option for us. I would say I want to research these two options and bounce them uh, out there for more feedback, not only from those present, with all due respect, but uh, I'd, I'd want to ask a couple of people beyond us because it sounds attractive now, but but so did my first girlfriend. Um, you know, <laughs> things change. So I just want to make sure that a vote like this would, would, would do it. Well, uh, yeah, I, I got to break in here and say it seems as if we have two distinctly different issues on the table at the same time. One of them is the issue of whether or not a video witness to a complaint could result in someone actually being a complainant. Um, and that's been most of the conversation between our lawyers in attendance, which by the way, has been really interesting and educational again to hear. And the other breaks completely new ground. And I don't think is supported at all by anything I see in the ordinance and I will read it again and look at it. And that is, Mikkel, your suggestion that the CPRB could be kind of its own the complainant in the process based on that video. So it would require a change to the ordinance for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in one case you could say, well, maybe the ordinance would allow, would allow this, although Mr. Simon probably would disagree. And on the other, uh, on the other hand, it really um, changes the nature of the body. Um, and I, I think that may be a, a good idea, although, I need to I need to think about it. Uh, a lot of the structure of this board was put together in, I mean, I'm just going to say a simpler time where I think uh, and remember that this ordinance was the product of deliberation by the, the city council and the vote by the representatives of the city of Urbana. So the, the, the city didn't come up with this ordinance, the elected representatives to the city council voted on this ordinance and actually it was a four to three vote um uh and that what we're, we've moved beyond that simpler time to to an era where we're talking real broadly and i think really beneficially about issues related to systemic racism and these long standard patterns of police action um and I can sense the frustration and I really resonate with the frustration of the public participation I hear because this board is not equipped to deal with that part of this. And I think what you're talking about, Mikhail, puts us into that, uh, brings us up forward in terms of what the perspective of the board might be. Uh, and so, although I'm not I'm not sure if I know whether it's a good idea. I want to I want to recognize that it's a creative idea to, that moves us a little bit more into the the cop treated me bad. I want to complain about the cop scenario into uh, an area where we might be a little bit more socially relevant. And certainly, we've been challenged uh, to be more socially relevant <clears throat> by the public participation that we've been having. Um, uh, so anyway, it sounds from the, from, uh, Ricardo and Scott that, um, that at least the two of you would like to table the discussion and not put forward any, any motion, uh, at this time. I, I'd agree with that too, Mikhail. I think okay. getting the input from the public would be important as well and, and not just from the people in attendance though i think it would be relevant and important to hear but give people an opportunity to to think about it just as we are going to have to and, and let them have their say if they want to megan 
I would also agree with that. Okay. Me too, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, um, I'm actually, I, I was about to say, I think we have a consensus, but um, Katrina, um, how are you in relation to this? I'm fine. Yes, you're okay with us. Um, Table in it, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm trying okay. to like multitask. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, um, so let's let's do that. Do we need a motion for that to carry it over to, as for it to the next meeting? I would move to table this discussion uh, until the next meeting, uh, which would be, I believe, the regular meeting. Second. Second. Um, thank you. I, I wish we could do all in favor, but uh, I, I, I'm told that Zoom requires us, that because we're on Zoom, we have to take a roll call. Tony Allegretti? Yes. Ricardo Diaz? Yes. Scott Dossett? Yes. Katrina Kendall? Yes. Mikhail Labinsky? Yes. Megan McGinty? Yes. Daryl Price? Yes. Okay, so, so it is. Um, all right, give me a second to pull up the agenda again. Okay. Um, we now move again into, into public participation. Um, so we open up the floor to those who are not part of the CPRB. Um, and again, we'll, we'll put five minutes on the clock for anybody who wants to say something. Um, let's go in reverse order from last time and give Jane McClintock the floor first. You might be muted, Jane. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on my phone. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Thanks, Scott. Um, I appreciate you guys bringing this up for comments and um, would would tend to agree, obviously, with much of what has been said, but, you know, also take issue. So I, you know, I appreciate that the ordinance is unclear. Um, I think we can all at this point agree on that. Um, I tend to disagree with Scott Dossett that the issues of civil rights and injustice that so clearly exist in our criminal justice system are beyond the scope of this board. I think that's very much what is, 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 is that's what the public wants you to do. And if that's not um, what you see as the role of this board, um, I think there'd probably be people who would um, happily take on that mantle and, uh, and fill your space. Um, I, so I strongly encourage you to move forward on this in um, a meaningful way. If what it needs to be is to take something to the council. Um, I think that I would like to see um, something be drafted um, and approved for the next city council meeting. I mean, this has been dragging for quite a while. So I really hope that there can be some movement on it. And if I can be helpful in any way, I would be happy to. Um, so, you know, thank you for you know, trying to trying to make this relevant and having this conversation. Um, and I, I hope we can move forward in some kind of productive manner. So thank you for all your thoughts. Oh, the other thing I think, you know, of course, we talked about it a great deal. Um, I should say you guys have talked about it a great deal. But um, the factuality of a video um, is, of course, critical. Like somebody has to ascertain that the video is factual. But let's say in the case of the um, the Lewis arrest recently, we had a uh, abundance of video from various angles. So the, you know, the fact that we have um, videographers who in their statements on YouTube and their posts on Facebook have actually stated that the video is accurate, that this is what happened in the video. If you look at Linda Kwan's video, she says, this is what happened in minute, this, 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 this is accurate. Plus there's the police video. So can a civilian make a complaint about a video which there which has been shown to be accurate? I think the accuracy piece is a total distraction. But at any rate, if you're going to, you know, broaden the scope, um, please do so. You know, we can stop nitpicking about um, various interpretations. Um, and I thank you all for, you know, all your thoughts and time and thanks for hearing me out and discussing this. So have a great evening. Appreciate it.
Thanks, Jane. And thank you for, for um, staying, reminding us of this particular issue for the past probably a few months. Um, I'm glad we were able to create space and really engage with it. Um, Chris, you have the floor. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, this is Christopher Hansen again. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to kind of work backwards from the, the the most recent item first. And the first one is the video issue. I've submitted video to the Urbana Police Department many times uh, regarding all sorts of different criminal cases. And one instance was an armed robbery. Another instance was a vehicle break-in, petty thefts, vehicle hit and run multiple times, and many others. There have been multiple instances that resulted in criminal charges. I have never once been asked by the Urbana Police Department or the state's attorney to verify the legitimacy of the recordings in any way. And we're talking about criminal charges here, which is a much bigger consequence than anything that might come out of the CPRB, which by ordinance cannot result in any cons consequence upon the police officers involved. You just don't have that power. Um, James Simon said himself in this meeting that a person who has witnessed a video can testify in trial about what they saw in the video. So I don't know why this discussion needs to be more complicated than that. Um, also, bundling complaints would work just fine. Uh, just make a big list of every single complaint related to the incident and move forward with the complaint process. We already do this kind of thing in court. If multiple people are suing over the same incident, it is common for there to be one lawsuit with multiple appearances by multiple parties or even a class action lawsuit. It's very simple. Um, to respond to Mikhail's point, um, there actually is a mechanism of investigation for any type of complaint, video or no video, out of the timeline or whatever, which is that it is written in the UPD policy to investigate all complaints, no matter what. Uh, the problem is that they simply don't follow, follow their own policy. They just ignore it and they don't investigate all complaints and that's why the CPRB needs to exist. Um, I also want to point out that there is a already a precedent for an investigation based on a video alone, and that is the taser review policy. This is in your ordinance. Um, this doesn't require a complaint, a complainant, or even the suggestion of misconduct. The investigation is in initiated simply by the fact that the video of a taser usage even exists, and, and it's written right into your ordinance. So I don't, I don't know why this is so contentious. Um, uh, next item is on the on standing complaints and appeals uh, based on my aggregation of my own records and my research and outreach, there have been something more like uh, 100 complaints filed this year. Uh, and the fact that CPRB thinks there is only one third of that is just a demonstration of how corrupt these city staff people are. Uh, and I'm talking about Bryant Serafin, Carol Mitten, James Simon and Vasilia Clark. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to revise your complaint form to reflect city policy, then I think the form should say that two out of every three complaints just randomly go in the trash. Uh, that would be reflective of policy and procedure. Um, and if you want to follow ongoing procedure, I think you should remove from the complaint form the part that says that complainants can't be retaliated against. Instead, to reflect you know, what is actually happening, you should change the complaint form to say that the complainant will likely suffer retaliation. So, and there's, a, there's a lot more to that list of things that you can change in the complaint form to reflect what is actually happening instead of what should be happening and happening by ordinance. So I, I think you'll hopefully stop that thought process. Um, earlier tonight, uh, Mikhail said something in regards to, you know, we, we, we are not questioning the character of city staff, but we're looking into logistics and procedure. Um, I don't know how far that's going to get you. You can change procedure all you want, but if city staff are willing to just violate the ordinance, you're going to have to question their character at some point. Um, anytime you ask James Simon a question, you need to keep in mind that one of the tools he employs to get his way is to simply lie. And he's done this many times. And this is not conjecture, it's been proven. Uh, and you witnessed some of Simon's being a weasel tonight. I mean, tonight we had three lawyers, if you count Jane McClintock's lawyer, who are all saying that James Simon is wrong and he still won't admit it. And this is what we're up against. And uh, okay, onto FOIA. Um, the simple way to deal with FOIA deadlines causing complaint problems is just to remove the time limit for filing complaints. I suggested this a year ago and it's gone nowhere. Uh, in regards to Ricardo saying, you know, we don't have anything to do with FOIA, well, that's not really true. I mean, in section 1927C of your ordinance, you have the authority to make recommendations to the police chief, mayor, and city council. So you can definitely tell them there's a FOIA problem. And um, if it's the case uh, that everything 
is being denied for FOIA because of retaliation, because people have submitted police complaints, like in my case, then that's also written into your ordinance in section 1928P, where harassment, retaliation, or retribution for filing a complaint is not tolerated. So it's definitely in your purview uh, to cover these things. And and they and that that is exactly exactly what is happening, by the way. They're they're refusing to give any police records uh, to people who might file police complaints. So um, there was also mention of having FOIA as an agenda item on the next meeting. I want to inform the CPRB that the city council already did this on July 20th, and it just turned into a huge show by Carol Mitten and James Simon to try to villainize people who submit FOIA requests. And Mitten and Simon just lied about many things. And so, and and Simon even contemplated today. You know, someone might submit a CPRB complaint, which includes an aspect of a FOIA violation within the complaint. And he said that's how he would submit it. Um, well, it is the case that I did exactly that uh, in the end of 2019. And Simon himself was the one who wrote me the denial letter saying we're not processing this as a police complaint. And it was against a, a, a sworn officer. It was against Bryant Serafin because he was the one whom I directed my FOIA request toward. So what Simon is suggesting people can do is exactly what he has denied people allowance to do. So I don't know why he's sitting there saying that. I, I mean, I, I haven't forgotten about it, James. I mean, you're the one who denied it. What the hell? Um, and if you're going to have some, some, I realize I'm pushing time. I'm almost on here. Uh, if you're going to ask for the staff to bring forward some uh, select FOIA requests for your review, don't let them cherry pick what they want. Just ask for all of the FOIA requests from 2020, wherein, residents asked for uh, police complaint documents. That, that would be instructive enough, I think, to see what's going on. And my very last comment is about uh, the suggestion that Michael Schlosser is an independent source of information. It is the case that he was considered for the Alea Lewis arrest review, uh, and they set him aside because he is so closely tied to the Urbana Police Department. So the presumption that Schlosser is an independent source of information is simply wrong. Um, last comment is that I appreciate that tonight's discussion was uh, a little more uh, spirited and digging into the truth of the ordinance. I think we need a lot more of that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Oh. All right, I want to make sure I didn't see any hands. Oh, no, I do see another one. Uh, Emily. Mm. Hello again. Hi, Emily. Um, this is Emily Close. I still live in uh, Champaign. I want to weigh in just a little bit on the FOIA discussion. Mr. Simon knows very well that seeking review from the PAC can take months or even years. And by um, directing people to go to the PAC or even initiate litigation, you're proving once again that there are th these obstacles exist and that they're put in the way of citizens to discourage them from filing complaints. The process is supposed to be accessible to citizens. You know, the regular people, the ones who vote, pay the taxes, and have to figure out how to navigate this unfriendly bureaucracy that is the citizen's complaint process. Most people are not the legal gymnast that Mr. Simon is. They can't ask the CRP to make an exception in the ordinance when no exception exists, or they would even not know how to do that. There's nothing in the ordinance that I know of that says it's okay to ask for a delay. If you did ask for a delay, it would be summarily squashed and your complaint would go probably into the circular file. So I think that um, these um, law, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, the clock was freezing. Um, I think these long, complicated, um, cerebral discussions about um, the complaint process are kind of taking us away from um, the fact that you only had three appeals in nine, 10, 12, whatever number of years that you've existed. So the process was summarily underused. So if you're really supposed to be serving the citizens of Urbana, um, I think that we have to take away the obstacles and telling people that, oh yeah, we won't give you the, the, um, the documents that you need to meet our timeline as spelled out in our ordinance and that, oh yes, just go to the public access counselor. 
well, do you think most people are going to wait one year to get an answer from them about, you know, whether they can get those documents? I don't think so. So I'm presenting myself as Exhibit A. I am now waiting for an appeal that I filed with the PAC for a complaint in Champaign I had against a um, police officer. And it's rapidly approaching one year. And with the coronavirus, it's probably going to be over that. So um, it's, it's just extremely frustrating. And I think it's disingenuous to say, oh, just say that you need more time. That's, that's just not, um, it's just not realistic. So anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks, Emily. And I'm sorry it's been so hard for you to get what you're looking for. I hope we can find a, find our way to a remedy for you. Um, Tracy, you have the floor. Hi, um, this is Tracy from Urbana. Um, I just want to um, echo what um, Emily Close has said. Um, I think James Simon knows very well that um, just suggesting um, the PAC or other processes, um, it's like a, it's like he knows that it's not going to help. For example, I too have submitted a PAC appeal, and I started that process in April, April nineteenth. So that has been what more than like, close to five months, and I, I still don't have any resolution. And this has caused this me not being able to get documents too. So it's like months, it's not a simple process. Plus, um, as I mentioned earlier, his suggestion at city council that I submit a fee waiver was again denied today. So um, I don't know, him coming up to placate residents. Um, sure, you might believe it, people who have not experienced all this might believe it, but the residents who are actually spending hours and hours of time, for example, tonight, we are here with you, like taking notes, following every meeting. We're spending hours trying to get documents and we can't do anything because the suggestions given are just not true. So I just wanted everyone to know what's going on. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, we've noted your presence here. And, and again, I just want to acknowledge that I hear how, how hard and painful it's been to um, uh, to go through and 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 submit the complaints and get the engagement from from the city and from us that you are wanting. Um, all right, we move into announcements. Um, so it looks like on September third we will have a special CPRB meeting. Um, with Mike Slasher and, and uh, to learn about the de-escalation training that the Urbana Police Department receives. Uh, on September 14th, uh, there's a city council meeting. So, oh, I'm sorry, this is the, Carol said this has been postponed. Yes. So, so thank you. Um, so we will wait until a different date um, for there to be a presentation by Richard Rosenthal about so civilian oversight models. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it's something that I personally have looked into, but I think it's really important information for the public to um, just really understand what models exist uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and by the way, civilian oversight um, has been around for over 100 years. So there really are several models and, and we've learned the, the, you know, the folks doing the work have, have learned a few things, I think, during that time. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Our next uh, regular monthly meeting, uh, they are of course on the fourth Wednesday of every month, will be September 23rd. Um, and I have uh, a personal announcement uh, that, I, um, that I ask for a couple minutes of your time. Um, after a lot of um, personal reflection and deliberation, uh, at the conclusion of this meeting, I will submit a letter of resignation to the mayor. Uh, I just want to briefly read this letter into the public record. Um, and so that, um, I'll do that now. 
I'm writing to let you know that I've made the difficult decision to resign from the CPRB effective August 27, 2020. The decision was difficult because I love the city of Urbana and have enjoyed contributing to the city for the past four plus years. The last five months when the board has started to examine its own and the city's longstanding policies in regarding to how complaints about police conduct are accepted, investigated, and reviewed have been particularly meaningful for me. I think we made significant progress during these months and hope the board continues to build on in these initial efforts. I know we have a long way to go. At the same time, it has become evident to me that the time commitment required of the chair in this moment in time is not sustainable for me. When I was recruited to the CPRB by Alex Batista in April 2016, it was essentially a commitment of about five to six hours per quarter or about 25 hours for the year, not including various training activities several times per year. When in March or April of 2020, I was appointed as chair at the recommendation of Preston James and appointed by the mayor, of course, it soon became apparent that the present moment required a much more active CPRB and a much more active chair. I proposed then that the CPRB rise to meet this moment by moving to monthly instead of quarterly meetings with special meetings and appeal review meetings as needed. I was glad board members agreed and this motion passed. In the meantime, I drastically increased my own engagement by reaching out to both individuals and groups in our community in order to better understand their needs and perspectives and to begin building some sense of trust in the CPRB as a body that was in touch with the needs and interests of our community. In that same spirit, I also, since becoming chair, started to work much more closely with city staff to examine current policies and training requirements, as well as schedule trainings and hearings and implement the changes approved in our meetings. There are some weeks that I've spent over 25 hours on CPRB related activities, more than during the previous year. This has been necessary and I have no re regrets about the time investment. However, it is also not sustainable for me moving forward, not only because the start of the new academic year is upon us, but also because of various personal commitments, including the need to support my mom after my father's recent death earlier this year. I've spoken to Ricardo about this and know he agrees with the need for active engagement at this time. Particularly in the present moment, I believe the city of Urbana needs an active and engaged CPRB with a chair who can continue to dedicate the time and effort necessary to both seek out public input and work closely with city staff. I know that the longstanding members of the board are invested and dedicated and that Ricardo's leadership will be conscientious, thoughtful, and fully capable of meeting the specific challenges of our time. Thank you for the opportunity to serve the city these past four years. Okay. With that, is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. Chairman, I would move to adjourn the meeting at this time. Wow. Second. Can we get a roll call, please? Tony, I'll the procedure, but it just feels big. Yes. It's all the way back to 20 and lower your head. Ricardo Diaz? Here, yes. Scott Dossett? Yes. Katrina Kendall? Yes. Mikhaila Bensky? Yes. Megan McGinty? Yes. Daryl Price? Yes. Okay, folks. Um, there are ways to get in touch with me if everybody needs to. Meeting is adjourned. Appreciate you, man.